Hello, welcome. I'm Alexis Badenmayer, Political Director of the Organic Consumers Association. And today I'm here with Mark Shepard. We're going to be talking about the power of perennial agricultural ecosystems to produce nutritious food while restoring landscapes. So Mark Shepard is most widely known as the founder of New Forest Farm. That's the 106 acre perennial agricultural savanna considered by many to be one of the most ambitious sustainable agriculture projects in the United States. New Forest Farm is a planned conversion of a typical row crop grain farm into a commercial scale perennial agricultural ecosystem using oak savanna, successional brushland, and eastern woodlands as the ecological models. Mark Shepard is also the award-winning author of the book, Restoration Agriculture, Real World Permaculture for Farmers. Welcome, Mark. Hey there, Alexis, how are you? <laughs> that, 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 um, that particular bio uh, annoys me to a certain extent, but it's the one that gets the most hits, and so I suppose it's the most popular. The whole most uh, ambitious sustainable ag project in the, in the USA stems from the fact that we can do this on every single acre of ground in the USA. We can mimic its natural plant community type and still grow agricultural crops on it, managing it as a uh, semi-wild system. That's what's ambitious about it. It's 100% of, of the continent, period. Cliffs, ditches, and everything. Well, I agree with that because <laughs> we were here when the Europeans showed up. So it makes sense to me. Um, where are you in the world and, and what sort of agriculture was there when you started your farm? <laughs> uh, the New Forest Farm is located in southwestern Wisconsin. It was a uh, subsidized corn and beans operation, formerly a mixed dairy. Mixed dairy wasn't making it. So the dairy, you know, went under and whoever the big ag guys next door kept, you know, cannibalizing. And currently right now there's two farms um, in it within a half a mile, half a mile, half an hour drive. And on one direction on the ridge, it's one farm. And on the other direction, it's another farm. And it's all cash crop, beans and corn. So do you have any problems with drift coming from your neighbors? What What's it like to be there in the middle of GMO, pesticide-soaked agriculture? Well, the... Um, <laughs> When, when spring is being done on their calendar instead of by the weather, uh, it can get ugly. And so that's typically when we choose to like go to town, you go somewhere, you go just get out of it. Um, but the whole property, uh, one of the first things we did is uh, you know, we've been certified organic since 1995. Uh, in the 25 foot uh, property boundaries all the way around the whole entire property, we put a, a triple row of trees, fast growing hybrid poplar on the spray side then double row of uh, white spruce on the inside. Um, and then in other areas, we even widened that buffer with uh, trees such as black walnut, which will be for long-term timber. So the whole core of the property is uh, about as protected as you could get in the Midwest. Of course, you know, we live in North America. It's impossible to protect from anything floating in in the wind, um, but it's about as protected as you could get. Yeah, that sounds like a really good plan. And that means one of the first things that you did when you got to this farm is plant trees. Was that always your, your plan that you would have a forest agriculture system? Yeah, the idea, um, I, I actually kind of came up with the idea. I was at a permaculture design course in 1993 at the Central Rocky Mountain Permaculture Institute in Basalt, Colorado. And I was teaching the segments on uh, soils and forestry, agroforestry, um, that sort of thing. And the other instructors who were on board were saying that, oh, with permaculture, we don't need farms. We'll grow all of our food in our front yard. You know, have a little carrot plant here and a broccoli there and a berry bush here. And it's like, time out. You know, there's not enough room in your front yard and backyard to produce enough calories, carbohydrates, proteins, and oils, the staple foods that you need in order to stay alive. So since I had the, uh, had the floor, um, I took the liberty to flip out gently and say, well, what we need to do now is we need to design farms this way so that we produce our staple food crops, not necessarily specialty items, but our substitutes for corn, substitutes for beans, um, and do it at scale so we can now plant it mechanically, maintain it mechanically, harvest it mechanically, process it mechanically, and get it to people's tables. 
And if, if you ate today, you ate from a machine, from industrial scale agriculture, get over it. If you're a member of a CSA, that's cute. That's not your food. Your food or your staple crops with, without which you cannot, you cannot survive. Well, okay. <laughs> I mean, I can't take issue with that totally, but I do think that people should mostly be eating vegetables and meats and buying them directly from local farmers, right? Oh, I agree with that too. Sure. That way everybody gets the most deal, the best deal. You get the most nutritious, freshest food and the farmer gets the highest pay price. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there's challenges with that. And, and I found myself smack dab in the middle of that when I first moved to Southwest Wisconsin in that we were basically four to four and a half hours from the nearest population center. And if we did a cute little CSA, um, how many people would we get to sign up? Well, everybody else is doing a cute little CSA trying to get everybody else to sign up because we come from an area that is a place that produces a surplus of food. There's not enough people to eat all that we grow. So it has to be exported somehow. So uh, I joined the Organic Valley Cooperative before it really got rolling. At one point in time, I was grower number 24. There's now over 1,200 members. Not a lot of people realize that Organic Valley started as a produce cooperative. And then some of the produce farmers uh, milked cows. And six of them, uh, they did the bravest thing I think anyone ever did, is they committed economic suicide in that they – they dropped their milk truck contract. They said, we're going to get our own truck and we're going to send it to a cheese factory and we're going to make cheese and label it and it's going to be organic and we're going to start this, you know, this new cheese line. And if they failed, they were out of business personally. And so fortunately, they didn't fail. And that, that, that economic uh, uh, stand fast, I mean, failure was not an option. It just was not an option in the early years. And I really give those six guys credit for doing what they did. Yeah, that's incredibly brave and it's an amazing origin story for a company that's now, it's not a company, it's a cooperative, but a cooperative that's now on the top 100 list of the biggest food companies in the United States. So it worked out. That's interesting. Why do you think that it started as a, a vegetable co-op, but ended up being mainly known from, for dairy? Well, it's, it's not the why did it start as a vegetable co-op, is there were a bunch of vegetable farmers. <laughs> they they were experiencing the same thing. Here we go, farmer's market. You work on Thursday and Friday, and you go to farmer's market for a couple hours, and you stand there. And when I have zucchini, you have zucchini, he has zucchini, everybody who's coming to farmer's market is growing zucchini. You can't sell your zucchini, so everybody says we have too much zucchini. But that wasn't the problem. The problem was they didn't have enough zucchini to be cost effective to put it on a truck and send it to Chicago or Minneapolis where they're buying zucchini by the truckloads every single day of the week. So they they pooled their resources together. You put it all on, on you know several different pallets, zucchinis, cucumbers, et cetera, and then ship it to a distributor, which flies in the face of a lot of people's uh, thought of what they think makes economic sense. We could sell at wholesale prices, which is like, dirt cheap um, and actually make money. But if we tried to sell it at retail, so like the food co-ops and so on, there wasn't enough volume even to pay for the freight to get the stuff to town. But if you put a pallet of cabbage together and sell it for eight bucks a box, you can send it to Chicago and you can sell every single last box of cabbage. So that's, that's why the produce part of it started. And it was a, a challenge in that uh, in Wisconsin, it kind of gets cold and frozen for a significant period of time. And so they wanted some way to uh, keep the buyer on the phone, seller on the phone with the buyer. And that's what the, uh, the first cheese did. Um, and then after cheese came eggs and then all these other different products of juices, and grains, uh, and, so, and so on and so on until now it's, it's been over a billion dollars in gross sales for close to 10 years now. Wow. So, so that was your first uh, market was in vegetables, but you were talking about how we need to have more staple crops grown in, in regenerative systems. So yeah. how did your farm evolve and diversify? Well, see, that, that was the uh, back, we got to backtrack again to the permaculture course is that we need to design these farms that are going to be perennial staple foods, um, not snacks and and uh, specialty items, but staple foods. So if we know that that's where we're going, uh, how do we cash flow to get there? So the cash flow to get there is we, we chose our, um, our cash crops 
and the ones that work best on, on uh, my operation with the soils I have and the, and the weathers that I have uh, was asparagus uh, for the springtime. I do cucumbers or zucchinis for midsummer, peppers late summer, and then uh, acorn squash and pie pumpkins for a, for a fall uh, harvest. And then I would use that, uh, grow those in the alleys, and in between the alleys of cash crop, I would uh, grow a row of trees. Well, what kind of trees did I grow? I grew the trees that imitated the various different levels in the oak savanna biome, which is where this farm is, and that overstory of Fagaceae, which were oak, chestnut, or beech, an understory of Malus and Prunus, which is apples and cherries, Hazelnut is the primary shrub, grapes is the vines, raspberries and blackberries is the canes, grass all over the place, fungi that's decomposing the leaves and the wood and living free in the soil, and the livestock uh, grazing all over the place. And so what that ended up being is that is a, a uh, it's not a purist ecological restoration, that's an agricultural mimic of an oak savanna and it behaves just like an oak savanna does. We have all kinds of um, strange and bizarre um, <laughs> species that keep showing up, strange and bizarre to a corn farmer, but huh. they're, they're, you know, they're rare native plants that keep showing up, rare native animals that keep showing up. Two years ago, um, we had a Massasagua rattlesnake, which is an endangered species, and it's not even acknowledged by the state as existing in Wisconsin. Last, uh, last 4th of July, I actually walked beside two young badgers and had a little conversation with them. And I learned that badgers purr. I never knew that. They, they just kind of made these really cute, like triple purring sounds. It was really cute. Cool. So, we, so we, can, we can accomplish both ecological restoration and food production on the same acres of ground. One doesn't exclude the other. So your, your system on your farm is very mature. Um, so, but you're still growing vegetables as your your market crop primarily. The last time we talked, you were looking for a way to process hazelnuts. Is is everything on your farm able to get to market in the same way? How is that working out? Uh, <laughs> boy, you had like five questions in there. <laughs> I'm not doing uh, asparagus wholesale anymore. I mean, I'm not doing produce wholesale anymore. I'm doing asparagus to a couple of retail accounts because you know, I can move most of it. I don't have to work so hard. Most of the sales now are coming from the perennial plants and livestock, from chestnuts, hazelnuts, and uh, hogs. Haven't done cattle for a few years. It's about time. Um, so that's where most of my sales are now on the perennial side of things. And thank goodness, because most of my fuel costs were in the annuals. So it was you know, weed control, tillage, et cetera, for organic produce. Wow, that's that's quite an achievement. Um, and I assume very that's still very rare. I know you've got a great network of folks through the Savannah Institute and other organizations that are promoting agroforestry. But but how? Yeah. So you're way ahead of the curve. <laughs> um, how are you? What What would you say to somebody who has just bought? or maybe inherited because it's really hard to to buy a farm these days but they're working with something that's back where you started what have you learned along the way that would speed that process to to where you've gotten having a, a primarily perennial farm well one would be is if you haven't read the book restoration agriculture read it because it evidently it's really well written if i knew it was going to win literary awards i would have done a better job at it it's not a scientific treatise. It's not a research document. What it is is it explains what I've done. This is what I actually did. I, I saw a review once. The guy says, oh, this, this guy's theory is great, but it's all full of holes. It's like, there's no theory. This is what I've done. Well, uh, so get that, read it, and understand it. If you want uh, further education and further understanding, go to restoringag.com. That's restoringag.com. And what that does is it's a 30-hour uh, course on ecology as it applies to managing a farm. And I'm going to use apples as an example because most people are familiar with apples. If I say orchard to you, you get this picture in your mind of what an orchard is. Now, and I've said this a zillion times before, and no one's proven me wrong, 100% of the problems that you will experience in an apple orchard are because you have this concept in your mind called orchard. 
and reality is not an orchard. Reality will never be an orchard. Reality will grow apples for you, absolutely. Oh, you're gonna have, in an orchard, this bug comes in and lays an egg. Problem! Now we have to fight against the problem and you're stuck in this fight against nature forever and you will always lose. Whereas if you go the way nature does, these pests and these disease tell you something about what's going on in your system and then that informs you as to how you should respond to your system and interact with it. So the uh, course at, at um, restoringag.com uh, is the, it's basically a college uh, level ecology curriculum, but I've cherry picked out the items that apply directly to us on the farm. Um, and one of the things I, I, I bring up all the time, I'm gonna keep bringing it up until people actually get it, okay? If you look at the ditch on the side of the road, nobody did cover crops, nobody did mulch, nobody plowed it, planted it, took care of it, weed control, pest control, disease control, cation exchange capacity, pyramids and spirals. Nobody did any of that to it and stuff grows. How, how does that work? How does that work? How does nature just grow stuff? And then we run it over with cars, we hit it with snow plows, we cover it with salt, and it comes back. That's called regenerative because it can regenerate with the conditions that exist right there. And if you happen to go on the side of the road, you'll be able to pick some mushrooms, you'll be able to pick some wild asparagus, maybe you got some berries. Well, how do we use the lessons that the ditch on the side of the road can teach us? How do we use that to design our farms and gardens? And so that's how I operate. And, and if you don't have to believe that this works, you don't have to think that this works, it works. It works in the cracks and in the ditches on the side of the road. It works on sheer cliffs. Just two weeks ago, I was about 150 miles shy of the Arctic Circle. True story. And there was a cliff, rocks faced straight up. And there was at least four layers of food growing there on the rock. No soil. No soil whatsoever. So if we can grow food on a cliff in the Arctic with no soil, we can grow food anywhere. Nature works. I invest in nature and natural systems. I'm willing to bet that nature is going to work. It might even work in my backyard. I, I, I wanted to do a big garden because I've got a huge yard. Um, but right now it's covered in Japanese knotweed, which turns cool. out to be edible. And so then I wondered, like, well, why, why bother planting anything that there? <laughs> but that's the problem, right? The Japanese knotweed? Or no. What do you think about, like, how... When you go from zero and you start looking at whatever happens to be on your land, what's, how do you take it? What, how does it go from there? So if, if you now begin to look at your backyard from the perspective of an ecologist, is here is this population of Japanese knotweed. There's other things going on there. There are reasons why the Japanese knotweed is, thri knotweed is thriving there. What are those reasons? You get to learn those. Well, if you know what those reasons are, you know that those causes created conditions that here they are and the knotweed capitalized on it. Well, what if we disturb the ecosystem? Disturbance in an ecosystem is wind, lightning, fire, grazing, earthquake, flood, that kind of stuff. So what if we go in and we mimic the natural disturbance regime of your area? Let's pretend a hurricane comes through and all these winds knocks everything over. Let's go to your backyard and act as if like this tree just went <laughs> and it blew over in the hurricane. We have a pit, we have a mound. So make a swale and make a berm. You have different planting conditions. Well then what would come in next? Uh, if there are oaks in your neighborhood, and I know there are, now you can go imitate the oak plant community type with chestnuts, apples, cherries, hazelnuts, raspberries, grapes, and then grass all over the place. And maybe you graze guinea pigs because you're in a suburban situation. Um, now you have a natural ecosystem that is recovering from disturbance. And then you just manage it from the, that point forward. Yeah, that, that, makes, that makes a lot of sense. It, you know, some people think that, you know, like you said, you started with the idea that, well, if we can see food growing on a rock face, we can certainly make food work in a regenerative system if we put our mind to it. Um, but a lot of people have this idea that that nature is best left undisturbed and that, you know, after it's been clear cut, we could just make a park and tell people to stay out of it 
and it'll come back. But that's not really how things work. If our human intelligence is applied to it, we can <coughs> help nature recover faster in more productive ways. Well, and then one of the things that might end up happening along with that too is that we might end up uh, nudging nature in a direction that favors us more than just a wild thing. Maybe if a hurricane comes through and it knocks everything over in your backyard, and let's use a modern equivalent of, of elephants actually. So the elephants come through your backyard, bulldozer goes, rrr, rrr. it makes a mess, but you've imitated what a hurricane would do when it, or an elephant would do when it knocks a tree over. Now start over. The system that you start over will mimic natural ecosystems, but it's not a knotweed patch. So we made a human decision to favor a habitat for us and for other wildlife instead of be this monocrop of a, of a rhizome growing non-native species that reproduces really fast. <clears throat> so a, a great example of, of uh, the nature um, idea is in, where the heck is it? It's in Wisconsin. It's uh, John Muir's uh, family farm where he grew up. I forgot what town it is. Is where? Port in Portage, Wisconsin. Now, of course, he was one of the, the first people to really describe, you know, nature, nat natural systems, say we need to leave it alone, leave it alone. So that farm where he grew up and he got so many beautiful, brilliant ideas and the inspiration to, to be the leader in conservation that he was, uh, in, in his will, it was put to a nonprofit organization to be always wild, meaning not managed by human beings. So what has happened is this beautiful oak savanna that used to have fire come through, it used to have elk grazing in it, used to have bison grazing in it, all of a sudden got arrested and people say, oh, we don't do anything to it anymore. So then it gets undergrown with buckthorn and uh, box elder and honeysuckle and garlic mustard. And it's the most amazing tangle of unproductive, uh, reproductively opportunistic species. I'm trying not to say the word invasive. That they, they found a habitat that they like and they're just growing like crazy. <clears throat> and so it's, this is nothing like what John Muir meant, but the words that he wrote said that it has to be forever wild and unmanaged. And the board of directors of the nonprofit is wrestling with this. How do we preserve what John Muir thought was perfect and wild? Well, what John Muir thought was perfect and wild was the, the remnant of an ecosystem that had been managed by human beings for 10,000 years and had been managed by wind and fire and huge herds of, of grazing livestock for thousands of years. When all of a sudden you take that management away, the humans and the wild animals, the fire and the wind, it just goes wild into a brush pile and it's not what John Muir meant. So that's, that's, that's their debate to argue. I know what my approach would be and I would go in there and turn it into a productive farm, harvest these items and sell them for cash. So you're paying for the ecological restoration with sales of farm products. <clears throat> so going back to something that you brought up earlier about what we should be eating. And, you know, because right now we grow a lot of corn and soybeans. And so we're mostly eating things that are made out of corn and soybeans, including animals. Um, is, is there a way that consumers by their, their food choices can help move agriculture in this restorative Direction. Well, I think that that's that's the easiest way to do it because we can we could move to Washington D.C. and lobby Capitol Hill until we turn gray in the hair. And will we really have affected any change? We'll make a little change and gets unchanged. Make a little change, gets unchanged. I don't know if there's ever going to be any progress with that town down there. Um, but the way to really make change is for consumers to vote with their dollar. Well, just like a natural ecosystem, we're not able to change completely overnight. So what we can do is we can make decisions, say, all right, well, first of all, uh, if I, I'll just use meat as an example, because it's a great punching bag these days. If I'm going to get, if I, if I currently eat meat, what I'm going to do now is I am now going to source my meat uh, from places that those animals eat what they were designed, adapted, created, or evolved to eat. Um, and so I will find a grass-fed brand of beef. I'll find a free range, you know, nut finished brand of pork. I'll find free range poultry. Well, then all of a sudden you say, okay, that's great. 
Well, <clears throat> instead of just having these free range cows that are like turned loose on the Western um, plains in the U S where they overgraze and all the uh, you know, jun juniper comes in and sagebrush and prickles and thorns, instead of being grass fed beef that degrade degrades the ecosystem, why not go to a farmer that's doing it in such a way that they're restoring ecosystems using livestock as the restoration tool. So like in, in my case, that's a loud sound in the background. <clears throat> in my case, the animals are the managers that actually do the work to accomplish the ecosystem restoration. So by them being there, they're actually creating a new healthier ecosystem that once upon a time was uh, a cornfield. <laughs> So you said you're you're doing uh, pork mainly on your farm now, um, and but you have done beef in the past. I have this sort of you know I'm not a farmer and I do live in a city, so I've got some misconceptions about things. Certainly, I feel that I was told a lie about this idea that nature can take care of itself best, and you can just ignore land and it'll miraculously spawn in Eden. So we've talked about that, but the other the other thing that I think I was well, that isn't true is that that animal agriculture is the problem and you know, I became a vegetarian back in 1990 I heard that the rainforests were being cut down for cattle grazing and so I said oh well it's easy to give up meat and you know people that I respect said it was a good idea so I went that route now I'm thinking okay I want to reintegrate you know I want to support perennial agriculture is what I want to support and one form of perennial agriculture is grazing animals. But then I think about chickens and, and um, pigs as animals that have to be fed grain that's probably grown in, in a less regenerative annual system. But you're doing hogs right now. So how does, how? and you say your, your hogs are managing this restoration. Uh, disabuse me of my illusions. <laughs> There's so many of them. <laughs> one, of, one of them that is interesting, uh, I do a lot of work in, in Africa, and so I'm going to use an African example to show something that's bad but not as bad. So th there's several different cultures that are broken apart by tribes. This first tribe goes in, and they they cut all the trees down in an area. They, they burn it all up and turn it into charcoal that they sell for cash to buy alcohol. Um, and then after a while, they don't have any more trees, so they move on. Well, then the... Um, the gardeners come in, the farmers come in, and they grow their little garden plot stuff, and they sell some stuff at market. And pretty soon the soil gets depleted, and so they move on. Well, then the cattle grazers come through, and they, they graze the dickens out of it until there's, like, nothing left behind. And then there's just this, you know, sandy desert left behind. Well, that is very destructive use of fire and agriculture and livestock. But then if, if uh, nobody moves in behind them, it takes time, and it recovers. It, take, it could take a long time to recover, you know, 150, 200 years. Who knows how long it takes to recover sometimes. <clears throat> the same would be true in the USA, except that what happened in the USA is Europeans came in. We clear cut all the forests and ship it overseas to make masts for warships and buildings and all that kind of stuff. Well, then we burned all the stumps, grubbed them out with, you know, Norwegian bachelor farmers and oxen. And then we plowed the ground every single year in some places for 250, almost 300 years. And that's never had a chance to recover. So now we grow corn and beans and, and eat um, tofu and say that we're, we're being helpful to the environment because we're eating, uh, we're vegetarians. Well, I'm sorry, but a cornfield, whether it's organic or conventional, is not healthy for the planet. I argue that a savanna with, how about chestnut trees, apple trees, cherry trees, grapes, plums, hazelnuts, raspberries, blackberries, gooseberries in the shade, mushrooms, green grass growing all around, all around with a couple animals in there is a far healthier place to live, even if you're vegetarian, vegan, because we don't have to eat the animals. Let's eat the chestnuts and the hazelnuts. It's a complete diet. There's our protein and our carbohydrate right there. And we've got all the berries for our fruits, for our vitamins, our antioxidants, etc. So I, I argue that a healthy, restored agricultural ecosystem is a, is a, it's a healthier diet to eat, and it is more earth-friendly than a vegetarian diet that's based on annual plants. 
Well, I've, I've come to the same conclusion. So in the last couple of years, I stopped being a vegetarian. But I still have this idea that if I'm eating 100% grass-fed beef, that's a 100% perennial agriculture project or product. But if I'm eating chicken or pork, that's not as regenerative because grain has to be grown for, for those animals. What do, you, what do you feed your animals and how does that fit into the system? All right, so let's go back to an ecosystem. I got chestnuts and hazelnuts and plums and apple, blah, 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 you name all that. Is there anything in there that's edible by a chicken or a pig? Absolutely, all of it. Is there anything in there? Now, are there ever any insects generated in there that the chickens want to scratch around and eat? Or are there any worms in it that the chickens can scratch around and eat? Uh, that's a 100%, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a perfect human habitat. It really is, and, and other animals as well. And now the pigs, the pigs manage the land by grazing um, beneath the trees. Uh, I do something, um, let me see, turn your head sideways and pull your hair back, let me see your ears. Do you have any earrings? Do they hurt? Okay, so I put rings in the pigs' noses so they don't plow the ground up and make a, a huge horrible mess. Pigs graze, they graze a lot. They also eat um, all of the fruits and nuts in the system. <clears throat> this time of year right now, the currants are just starting to come ripe. And so they're walking around and they'll be pulling currants off the bushes. They'll, they'll, they eat you know, everything that's in that system they eat. So they graze. So they're keeping the grass down, which is reducing the competition for my trees. And then they're manuring and they're adding urine, which is fertilizer for the trees. So they're doing, uh, and part of what they're doing also is pest control because uh, some of the earliest fruit that falls off the trees, it's called the June drop in most places, is because a pest has gotten into the apple and it sends a signal to the tree that this one's not gonna make a good fruit. So it drops that fruit and there's a little larvae inside. So the pigs go through and they gobble, gobble up all those larvae. So they're doing pest control. Um, they're also doing vegetation control, pest control, fertility. Um, and cattle, <clears throat> they'll eat a lot of leaves. They're especially useful in the fall. Um, when, they've, when the grass really isn't growing uh, vigorously anymore, um, the leaves have all fallen to the ground. They'll start to eat leaves off the ground. Well, when you eat all the apple leaves, there's now no more spores of apple scab, which is one of the biggest you know, problems with apples. So they eat up all the apple scab spores, and now you don't have that scab in infection next spring. So there's a lot of subtle things that happen that you know, we're learning more every single day um, that it's significant. It's really significant. So I've never sprayed anything in... Uh, <laughs> I've been certified organic since 1995. Never sprayed any kind of organic pest control thing ever, period. Yeah, that's saying a lot. So, <clears throat> I mean, this is, that's kind of the holy grail of regenerative agriculture is to be able to have a closed loop system where you're not importing your fertility, <clears throat> your, your animal feed, there's no waste that leaves the farm. So you've managed to do this with... And, with and if, and if Sorry. I might, and if yeah. I might um, add to the word regenerative, because I study a lot of ecology, ecological systems, the word regenerative, regeneration, has a 400-year scientific track record and a definition of what it actually means, and it's not necessarily what the current use of the term is, and I want the current use of the term to go right back to the science, because the science says it's the ability of a system to grow, to thrive, and then to reproduce itself with the current conditions that are there and within the disturbance regime of that place. Then it regenerates. So if you have a broccoli patch and you're certified regenerative with a gold seal and a green sticker on your forehead and you know a wind comes through and it knocks your broccoli plants over again, if your broccoli plants stand themselves back up and, and grow and then reproduce and make more broccoli, I'll grant you regenerative. <clears throat> My system can be struck by lightning, blown down by tornado, trampled by bison, uh, burned by fire, and it all comes back. That's the ecological meaning of the term regenerative. And that's the one that I want us to hold as the highest standard. Because if you think about it, when the human race finally produces its food in a truly ecologically sustainable and regenerative manner, what's the problem? You know, we are, we actually are part of the solution. 
So, so you would reserve regenerative to perennial systems. Pardon? You would reserve the word regenerative to perennial systems? I would reserve the term regenerative to regenerative systems, which okay. means those systems can reproduce themselves and expand their populations, and they include annual plants. Let's go okay. back to that tree that blew over in your backyard. There's all this exposed dirt. The first things that come up are the annual plants, really fast growing and have oodles of hard seeds that store a long period of time. Um, can you say grains? Well, the reason why they need to store a long period of time because succession takes place. Then in come your perennial grasses. Then come your, your broad leaves and your thorny things. Uh, then your shrubs and then your sun loving trees and your shade tolerant trees. And then it eventually turns into your place's version of a closed canopy forest, whether it's you know redwoods or pinyon or the eastern woodlands up where you are. <clears throat> so that process will occur and the annual plants, those seeds fell to the ground, those poor things, they don't have the right conditions yet. They have to wait for the next hurricane to knock a tree over or for the bison to go through and trample up the ground. So uh, ecologically regenerative system includes annual plants. And that's, that's why I like to use the agroforestry systems because this is, this is not a purist ecological restoration, but it's a mimic of a natural system. And here's the disturbance. Boom, I go through the tiller. Well, what happens when you till the soil? What happens if you use herbicide on the soil? You're gonna start burning your, your carbon that's stored in the soil. Well, the carbon is the energy, that's the fuel that feeds the soil food web. And that as the, all those critters in the soil uh, eat that carbon, it, they poop and they pee, they release the fertilizer that you now grow your annuals in. So you grow your annuals in, maybe two, maybe three years of annuals, and you go right back to perennials and you go through the successional process again. So in my annual fields, I typically would have three years uh, after my last annual plant, it would go into uh, cover. And I've got two fields right now that are just beautiful and full bloom with um, hairy vetch. Uh, and it's been three years getting to this like beautiful pure stand of hairy vetch. Next year, if I go ahead and I till that up, um, that'll grow, you know, squash like rocket fuel. It's, it's incredible. So I have this episodic pulses, and you do the research. <laughs> if you go to restoringag.com, one, one of the presentations shows you that during ecosystem disturbances, if you have all this biomass above ground, you know, fire, windstorm, whatever, it comes by and it disturbs that. Well, all of the nutrients that were stored in the roots now are leached out of the system. So since we know that that happens in natural systems and in agricultural systems all along the way, let's get an annual crop in there with good deep penetrating roots and suck up that nutrient before it goes away, keep it in the system. Now let's build up extra carbon in the biomass straw in our grains and our root systems and have everything composted right in place. Then after two years of annual production, we go back to perennial pasture high on the legumes. And so you, you mine your carbon, you build the carbon, you mine the carbon, you build the carbon, mine the carbon, build the carbon in the annual plots. In the, in the perennial rows, um, started as red clay, it's 25 years ago now, started as red clay, and now you can reach under with your hand and it looks like forest duff underneath. It's a radically different soil. Whoa. All right, so you probably don't understand why I keep asking you this question because it makes perfect sense to you, but really you don't bring feed from off your farm to feed your pigs? You're, I mean, now I'm seeing that the way I'm picturing your farm now, and I'm seeing that they're that you might actually need pigs to clean up all of the things that drop from the trees and the bushes and the vines. You need pigs to come through and clean that up, but, yeah. but they can survive on what's on your farm without you growing feed specifically for them? I don't grow feed specifically for them, but I am a member of a co-op, Organic Valley Co-op, and I've got neighbors and friends who are growing annual grains. I currently right now have uh, my, my farm manager is right across the table from me. We got one, two, three, three acres of, of rye and two or three acres of barley that are part of the system. We can, we can either have that combined off to use as feed or we can have the animals come in and, and eat it as feed directly. Um, but uh, when I feed my pigs, I get enough, I buy it in bulk. So I get enough to feed each pig. I get them about 30 pounds when, the, well, when I bring them on the farm and they only get a cup and a half of grain per animal per day which in the, in the course of a, uh, a full growth season, it's about 130 pounds of grain 
to feed that animal. 130 pounds of grain, um, that's, I could have enough feed on one acre for 10 or 12 animals. And if one acre out of 100 is annual, that's a really small, small proportion of it. <clears throat> so my pigs get, you know, they get a, a supplement. It's mostly for the vitamins and mineral supplement because soils are always slightly imbalanced and we can work at amending them over time. But I bring that in, uh, one is bait, because you bring the feed to them, you whistle for them, they come running, they get their snacks, they get their vitamin supplement, you scratch them and you pat them, you do a general health analysis, see how they're doing. Um, and then no matter, later on in the summer, no matter where I am, you just give them a call and they come running. <clears throat> they know what it's all about. And then, <laughs> The last month of their life, we feed them their snacks on a trailer. And so when I get up in the morning, they're waiting for me on the trailer. And then I just shut the gate. It's no big deal. Every once in a while, <laughs> I've only done it a few times, but it's just so much fun to do it. Is They're on the trailer waiting for me in the morning. I shut the gate, I hook up the truck, and I drive them around the block, and I bring them back. And they're like, oh, wow, where did Dad bring us today? <laughs> and so they, they get you know, accustomed to being in a trailer and, and driving around. It's no big deal. They do have probably a pretty hellacious last few minutes of their lives. Well, I, I should ask you about that because that's one of the essential things. If you want to raise animals, you have to have a place to slaughter them. And in the monopolized system that we have, JBS, Tyson, Cargill, et cetera, they have the lock on slaughterhouses. What do you and mean? Whoa, 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 what do you mean? Well. What's to, stop, what's to stop you and everybody on this list from starting a slaughterhouse? Well, what did you do? How did you, where do you slaughter your animals? And, and let, me, let me tell a story once again about this little co-op called Organic Valley. All by themselves, they weren't powerful enough, strong enough, they didn't have enough political connections, but you put 10 of them together, all of a sudden we can all put up 10% to pay for number 11. Now we've got a salesperson. Then we make more sales, we go get more farmers, we can have more staff, we can make more buildings. So by pooling together, we now act as if we are a big guy. A billion dollar business is a big deal. We can throw a lot of weight around. Well, uh, Organic Valley itself doesn't own the slaughterhouse, but there's enough of us in the area that, that justify a slaughterhouse being built just to handle our stuff. And um, if, if you, this is actually one of the permaculture principles that I kind of have revised. If you hear the word, wherever you hear the word problem, that's the word profit spelled incorrectly. If you have a problem accessing a slaughterhouse, well, dang, somebody ought to be able to make a whole lot of money at that. And then you go and you investigate that why isn't there a slaughterhouse being built? It might be because not enough of your friends are, are collaborating with you. And so I don't ever want to get as big as Will Harris down in Georgia, who's one of the finest ecosystem managers that I've ever met in my life, um, where he built his own. You just make your own investment, you borrow the money, and then you hire all your own employees and you run enough of your own animals through it, it makes business sense. Well, <laughs> for one, I'm not that competent. <clears throat> so I'm gonna collaborate with you know a hundred other of my buddies so we can go ahead and we can build one of these slaughterhouses. And if it has to be USDA inspected and certified, it's so be it. It's just gonna cost more money, which means we have to run more animals through, which means we need you to raise 10 instead of five. And it becomes an issue of, of will. Instead of stopping ourselves from doing something really, really cool, let's find out what does it actually take to solve the slaughterhouse problem. Then let's do it. That's, that's, it's as easy as that. It's a design issue. None of this hand wringing and, oh, moan, moan. Let's write letters and complain to the politicians who don't do crap anyways. Doesn't matter what team. <laughs> All right. Well, well, I'm in that chair, though. I want to ask you one more thing about that. <laughs> did, did you have problems during? COVID with the slaughterhouse backing up and they're not, you know, animals having to wait to be slaughtered. Did that happen in your area or was, did things move smoothly? Uh, they moved smoothly if you were already uh, signed up and in. If you waited till the last minute, till you had sales to go ahead and sign up for slaughterhouse space, you were screwed. But, you know, every year, you know, we sign up for a number of slots and that's that. We will take that number of slots, period. Um, and so that hasn't been an issue. What is interesting during the whole COVID thing, um, I didn't really travel a lot. And then prior to COVID, people were like, um, 
gee, Mark, you know, you're so antisocial. Why don't you get out and around? You know, I always want to hang out in the farm, blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, yeah, it's a beautiful place. Why would I really want to go to town? I, this is all here. Well, then during the whole COVID thing, people are like, wow, Mark, you're brilliant. What an amazing survival strategy. It's like, I don't have to leave home. It's all right. <laughs> Yeah, that is beautiful. I, if I could have picked any place to be during COVID, it would have been your farm for sure. Um, okay, no, so no, no comment because you know <laughs> we we don't take we don't take slaves, we don't take interns, we don't do employees. <laughs> we only work with uh, private, independent um, business people. So you would have right, to have like some this? you would have to have some sort of enterprise that paid your way while you were here. Okay. <laughs> I won't ask again. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so I want to ask you about something. What is STUN, S-T-U-N? Well, STUN was a, a term that I uh, coined that originally meant sheer total utter neglect. Um, but I've modified it through the years to mean strategic total utter neglect. And I'll go back to the example of a ditch on the side of the road. And you look at the stuff growing in the ditch on the side of the road. Nobody spent any money or gave it any attention, and it grows. It grows with sheer, total, utter neglect. It actually, it grows with stunna, sheer, total, utter neglect and abuse. Um, so if we can go ahead and plant a system uh, and intentionally uh, don't take care of it as well as we would like to, we're told that we're supposed to dig the $40 hole for the $10 tree and do cover crops for a couple of years and add the compost and the manures. Well, what if you don't do any of that? What if you don't do any of it? Okay, so the tree grows slower. Well, then you won't have aphid problems because it's growing so fast that the aphids are coming to get the excess nitrogen in there. If you let the weeds grow like crazy, the deer don't see them and they can't come along and bite your trees and require that you put on you know, five-foot tree tubes or a 85 foot high nuclear powered electric deer fence. Um, if you just leave them out there to, to grow like crazy, they grow slower. They all of a sudden have to figure out, it's like, look, if I'm gonna survive, I gotta get my roots down below this grass in a hurry or die. So they do. So the trees that, that survive you know, their early years of less than uh, ideal care, they're more rugged. They're rougher and tougher and they, are, they can handle it. We haven't had rain yet this spring. This is supposed to be the wet time of year where we get all of our spring thunderstorms. Um, fortunately, all the different water catchment channels, swales and berms on my farm have been catching it and soaking it in through the years. Um, so they have that stored in the soil, but they're already, their roots are deeper than your average tree roots because they were, they were kind of forced to do that through stun. Stun will also find out the ones that reproduce quicker, uh, reproduce the most, reproduce pest and disease free, and then those are the ones that you grab their seed and you reproduce that over and over again. So over time, we improve the genetics of our woody species as well as the animal species so that we have uh, early production in the, in the life of the plant and high yields with pest and disease free um, as best as possible. I am thrilled by this because I, I think I might have a a calling in agriculture, if I can just neglect <laughs> things. Um, my raspberry bush that's is the nice. thing. We, we're all good at it. We can all do that, right? <laughs> and it's cheap. It's cheap. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. All right. So you, you you said it was a piece of cake to bring people together to to create. I said it was a piece of cake. Oh, oh oops. Okay. Well, <laughs> but, but you guys did it. You managed, your, you and your neighbor farmers were able to get you know, get enough people together to have regeneratively raised animals and get them slaughtered. How about for the the nut business? For hazelnuts, you said you're doing um, chestnuts. What what sort of processing do you need for nut crops? And was it there or did you have to create it? Chestnuts are the easiest um, in that you just pick them up off the ground, you run them through a produce washer and it goes out as fresh market produce. They're highly perishable. They don't store on a shelf. They need refrigeration. Um, hazelnuts are a different matter. The, the eastern shrub type hazelnuts, they need to be removed from the husk. They need to be cracked, sorted, sized, separated, packaged, and have value-added products made. And so one of the enterprises that I am uh, part owner of is the American Hazelnut Association, American Hazelnut Company, excuse me, AHC. Um, you can find their link online. The American Hazelnut Company, in collaboration with the University of uh, Minnesota mostly and Wisconsin, uh, have up in northern um, Wisconsin is a uh, like an incubator processing facility 
where we've gone around the world, various different places and have other people do do it yourself stuff. So we have all of the rudimentary pieces in line and not fully connected yet. And that's a collaborative venture. I don't know how many dozens of, of hazelnut growers are a part of the American Hazelnut Company. And I, I also know that there's at least, there's, there's probably more, but there's at least three different pools of growers uh, in the northern tier of the states that are doing the same thing uh, specifically with hazelnut. They're also doing it with, with uh, hickories, with pecans, with native pecans, not the big, huge paper shelf, but the native pecans. And all it takes is enough of us sticking together and deciding to work with one another. And that's what I found is the most difficult because I had such a uh, successful early experience with Organic Valley, a bunch of people get together and yeah, let's work together. We all work together and it's financially successful. I thought that people knew how to work together. I thought that people naturally want to collaborate. And what I've found out uh, in the years since then is that's somewhat of an oddity. Um, you know, if you just pick a random sample of 10 people off of the, the chat list here and you put them together and have them collaborate, I'm willing to bet you a nickel that someone thinks he's smarter than the other ones. Someone else thinks they have a better tech than the other ones. Someone else has a better technique and they're not going to share. Then somebody wants to do open source, not because they want to share everything, because they want to steal your stuff. And it'll just degenerate into this rat's nest of crazy crap. And I've seen it over and over and over again, those issues coming up in groups of people trying to work together. The American people for generations has been trained been programmed and brainwashed to think that we are these independent, you know, pioneering whatever is we can go on on our own, the safe, self-made man, and blah blah blah. That is a that is a that's a propaganda technique by the controllers who want you to be disempowered. You want to be you whining about I wish we had a slaughterhouse instead of getting your shit together, working together, and making stuff happen with whatever resources you have at the time and bootstrapping it if you have to. Because that's where the real power is, is with us actually working together. Yeah, I feel like it might be a generational thing. Like you're, well, you're not much older than I am, but it seems like we- You don't look like, a day over 80, how about that? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it just, it, there was more of a co-op movement before, but anyway, maybe it's coming back and, and success stories like Organic Valley and others can can bring that, that co-op spirit back and this idea well, of, and just a little tidbit, tidbit on the co-op idea. Um, I also am of the opinion that the co-op is a model that was put up by our government in order to disempower people to force it to fail. And let's take uh, the, I think it's called section of code 158 is the, the, the US code that describes what a co-op is. It limits the uh, return on your investment to the, to the owner. It limits it to 8% per year. Now. When I joined Organic Valley, there was only uh, 24 growers. Uh, it was $300,000 in gross sales with all of us combined. And then 10 years later, it's a billion. Now, if I had joined and bought shares of Microsoft when there were only 24 shareholders and it went to a billion 10 years later, I'd be a zillionaire. But a co-op's not allowed to do that. So I'm more of a fan of LLCs or C corps or B corps, because then the farmer, instead of getting limited to 8%, now 8% is really good in some places. And it's been one of the best investments of my life is being a part of Organic Valley. But I would rather have an unlimited top side and have every, and that's what the American Hazelnut Company is, is that the investors and the growers, um, you know, you can buy either investor shares or grower shares. And as the company, you know, gains in value, so don't your shares, not limited by federal government. Yeah, there's someone in the chat who says um, also you need for a co-op you need a ridiculous amount of insurance. You, you need you need a ridiculous amount of insurance for you know other corporations as well. Okay. Uh, and even on the farm, you know, just for for my farm alone, I need over a million dollars worth of liability insurance in order to sell produce. You know, thank you to the Food Safety Modernization Act. Love you. Yeah. Yeah. We don't don't get me started on on FISMA because you know too much about it and I just get angry. <laughs> Well, no, I think it's a good topic. I mean, I think that they we should be skeptical of these structures and wonder where corporations are getting the advantage and where we're being shafted. I mean, that's not, that's not a bad thing to, to be always on the lookout for. Well, and also what it should do, back to this problem means profits building correctly, 
look out if you have bad guys in your universe, go learn from them. What are they doing that's allowing them to do what they do? And then uh, aside from something that goes against, you know, general decent morality, uh, imitate that, imitate that. The, the big boys are playing with some really serious uh, legal structures and entity relationships that are amazingly powerful, so much so that Who's that Bezos guy we heard about that there was like a news report leaked a couple days ago? He didn't pay any taxes. He make he has more money than anybody else in the whole wide world. Well, horrible crime. It's like, no, it's not a horrible crime. He's obeying the law. The law is designed for you to run your business in such a manner that everything gets recirculated, recirculated. It's just like an ecosystem. Any sunlight that comes into my farm goes around and around and around. The fertility keeps going up, 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 up. And I don't want it bleeding away. It's the same thing that somebody can do with like a zillion dollar corporation and, and end up not paying taxes. Well, Mark, this has been an amazing conversation. We've got three minutes left and I want you to tell us what your dreams are for your farm. I know you're so far ahead of the curve, but even you must have ideas you haven't tried yet that you want to, to experiment with. Well, what I'm experimenting with mostly isn't just like the farm. The farm, that's just one piece of real estate. I don't know if you're aware of this, but I've got real estate in several different states, a couple different countries, and, and it pays for itself and it actually makes a capital gain, which accumulates to your net worth and it was all done without ever having a job it's all done on 100 percent debt financed so how do you do that it's called math and so what i'm working on with other different investors and groups is we are doing this as a real estate investment strategy you buy this piece of property you upgrade it ecologically and the farm activity that ecosystem i was talking about that is what now improves the value of that asset so that umpteen years down the line, it's worth more. So you can either refinance to go get another one, or you can you know, sell it at a dramatically increased um, capital gain. And so that's what I've been playing for the past. That's the real game that I've been playing for the past 30 years is how can I be a bum hanging out in the woods, scratching pigs behind the ears, eating really, really well, um, and, and living a good life, living a good life. Well, thank you so much for sharing your secrets with us. Um, yeah, so tell us again how to tell us again about the book, your website, and how to learn more. Well, uh, you have there's two books available through Acres USA. One is Restoration Agriculture. Uh, the other one is Water for Any Farm. It talks about you know key line design, water management systems, USDA terraces, and all that kind of stuff. And then if if you are at least intrigued about Restoration Agriculture go to restoringag.com, and that's an online course that's the ecology of restoration agriculture systems. And through that platform is where we're bringing in our uh, additional stuff on real estate investment and credit, um, using credit wisely, et cetera, et cetera. Wow, all the secrets will be revealed. Well, Eventually. <laughs> <laughs> this is awesome, Mark. It's really great. Um, Amazing conversation. We'll be doing more of these conversations with other folks doing agriculture, regenerative agriculture in the Midwest through Regeneration Midwest. So stay tuned and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Lexis. Thank you. Bye-bye.